So it is my privilege to introduce our uh, very esteemed speaker this evening, raised in Ripley, Ohio, and ask him where Ripley is. Uh, Steve, Steve Stivers, ask him when he gets up here. Steve Stivers learned from his mother and father the importance of family, hard work, and public service, which have been the values he has carried with him through his life, whether as a student at The Ohio State University. We're going to make it. OH, that's right. Whether as a student at Ohio State, a soldier serving overseas as a state senator or as a member of Congress. Steve is currently serving his second term and was just reelected to his third term. <clears throat> and quite frankly, he should have been elected to a fourth term, but we won't mention her name, will we? It's a good thing she did not win her judgeship, but that's another story. Steve currently serves uh, the Ohio 15th Congressional District, which is made up of 12 counties, including all of Athens, Clinton, Fairfield, which is my county, Hawking, Madison, Morgan, Perry, Pickaway, and Vinton. He also serves parts of Fayette, Franklin, and Ross counties. Congressman Stivers has been tapped and has been serving for the last several years on the House Financial Services Committee, which is a very important committee of ours. That oversees banking, insurance, real estate, public and assisted housing, securities, and the CFPB. And you can rest assured he will talk to us about that this evening. Members who serve on this committee also work with housing and consumer protection legislation, oversee Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, the FDIC, the uh, U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, and the Fed. Throughout his career, Congressman Stivers has led the way supporting programs and initiatives to encourage job creation, promote economic development, and put our country's fiscal house in order. As he wrapped up a successful first term in office, two of his veterans' bills, the Hire at Home Act and TRICARE for Kids, were rolled into the National Defense Authorization Act and signed into law by the President. Prior to running for Congress, he served in the Ohio Senate and before that worked in the private sector for the Ohio Company and Bank One, where he focused on promoting economic development and encouraging job creation. Congressman Stivers is a career soldier. He served 28 years in the Ohio Army National Guard. And he holds the rank of Colonel, so you better stand up and give him a salute. He served uh, our country overseas during Operation Iraqi Freedom in Kuwait, Iraq, Qatar, and I'm not even going to say the other one, <laughs> Djibouti. <laughs> he led 400 soldiers and contractors and is proud that each and every one returned home safely to the United States. <clears throat> He's received the Bronze Star for his leadership throughout the deployment. He's received both his bachelor's degree and his MBA from Ohio State, resides in Columbus with his wife Karen and their two children, Sarah and Sam. It is my great pleasure to introduce my congressman, Steve Stivers. Thanks, Sean. It's great to be with you. I really appreciate the chance to chat with you a little bit today. Before I get started, I do want to uh, tell you that when you go together and you know have this competition for the Political Action Committee, it helps you make a difference on some of the issues I'm going to talk about tonight. Because the PAC funds are not about you buying influence, they're about you supporting people who are going to support the policies you care about. And so whether they're Republicans or Democrats, support people who support your industry. That's how your industry is going to get stronger. So the people who have given tonight, thank you on behalf of your own industry, because you're going to help yourselves be more competitive. So I'm glad you've chosen to get engaged and involved. And you know, I thought Alan told a great story about making a difference. And I've only been in Washington four years, but this town can be very frustrating. Not much happens in this town. I was a state senator before I was here. I was in the private sector in securities and banking before that, and um, this town can suck the life out of anybody. So be careful while you're here. But, uh, but it, it, 
this town can also work. I, I believe that. I am a glass half full kind of guy. And I believe that we can solve America's problems. I think Tuesday night went a long way to solving some of America's problems. And I think we will. So I, I want to tell you a little bit about me and tell you about some issues I think you care about and what I think we're going to do about them, what the elections mean to the future. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about uh, you know, the short term, what's going to happen between now and the end of the year, but more importantly, what's going to happen after January. So um, that's kind of what I'll talk about. So as I said, I've only been in Congress um, two terms. I got elected to my third term last Tuesday. And um, so I'm a relative newcomer here. But when I got here, I got engaged in a few things. I went on the Financial Services Committee because I was in the securities and banking industry before I came to Congress. And I thought like, felt like you know, the member from my district has been engaged in this committee actually since 1954 with Chalmers Wiley when he became the uh, member from Central Ohio in the 15th district. And then Deborah Price was on the Financial Services Committee. And then a lady who beat me and then I beat named Mary Jo Kilroy even served on this committee. The difference is she actually took things backward when she served on the committee. But, um, but the people figured that out and she's gone. So, um, but, uh, so I'm new, but I got involved in two things, or three things when I got here. One, the Financial Services Committee, because I know if you can't afford to finance the American dream, the American dream is dead. That includes whether you're financing a car, whether you're financing a home, whether you're financing the purchase of a small business, whether you're accumulating capital and taking company public, those things matter. America is great because of our finance sector. Because if you can finance a dream, you can live a dream. And, um, and we need to make sure the people who are financing the dream can actually pay back the dream, but that's what we didn't do right for a little while. But we're getting there, and, and you guys take that risk every day. And if you're willing to take that risk, and if banks are willing to take that risk, then that's great. And I don't think that underwriting should become a check the box, yes or no, do we meet the CFPB's rules, or don't we? Uh, and the CFPB's come out with some really negative rules that could kill finance and make more people pay more and make getting financing difficult for more people. So the first thing I did when I sat down is I said, how's business? And people said, oh, you know, it's been pretty good this year. And, you know, I know you're in your kind of slow period for a little while, but um, I think things are getting better. But what's going on in our financial regulations threatens to throw that out the window and, and make that really risky. You know, the CFPB's desperate impact rule really could impact many of you in this room in a very, very negative way. And the new majority we have in the United States Senate is going to help make sure that doesn't happen. The other two things, there it is. <laughs> the other two things I got involved with here is the National Republican Congressional Committee, because I know I want to be in the majority, because you don't get to pass laws unless you're in the majority. And so we grew our majority in the House on Tuesday as well, which is really important, because we've had a paper majority for the last two years. We had a 17-vote majority. And we have about 20 guys who either want to or think they have to vote no on any given bill. And so you do the math. If you have a 17-vote majority and you have 20 guys that want to vote no, you can't do anything, right? So that's been a problem. So we picked up uh, a dozen seats, which is great. And there's uh, two more that I think will win out of the five that are uh, uncalled races yet. So I feel really good about where we are in the House. We are going to uh, have... Uh, you know, uh, almost a 30-vote majority, a 28-29 vote majority. I feel really good about that because we still have 20 guys that either want to or have to vote no, and that's okay. They can vote no, and we can still get things done. So we now have a real working majority, and I'm, I'm happy about that um, because that matters. And um, that's, uh, that's why I got involved in the NRCC because – we have to be in a majority before we can actually get things done. And so um, we'll continue to see things like the CFPB's 
you know, desperate impact rule, but there's some things we can do to put the clamps on them in the future, and I think that that's what we will do. So we have about, uh, we have 54 seats in the House right now, 53, I'm sorry. After December, that we'll be at 54, because I, the Republican will win the Louisiana runoff. I'll go ahead and tell you that. Now you can read it in the newspaper three weeks from now, but that's what's going to happen. Um, and that's a good thing. Um, so 54, though, is not 60. So we will need to, we have an obligation to work with Republicans and Democrats and be responsible and send reasonable things to the president so that we can get things done. But for the first time in four years, we have a real Republican majority in the legislative branch so we can actually pass bills, send them to the president, and he can decide whether he wants to sign them or veto them. That's how the process is supposed to work. I think it's going to be healthy for America. I think it's going to be healthy for this president. He will probably veto some things we send him. But if we are thoughtful and responsible, hopefully he won't veto that many. And that's okay. And we can have a dialogue about what we're trying to do and why, what our agenda is. And he can talk about why he's against our agenda. He's been telling everybody we don't have an agenda and we're the party of no. But guess what? We're going to be passing bills and he's going to be having to decide if he's for them or against them. And I think that's going to be a great thing for America because there will be things getting done. And I think he will sign a lot of our bills and because a lot of the things we do are reasonable and make a lot of sense for a lot of folks. So uh, I think that uh, we will be thoughtful, we will be reasonable, and we'll send him things that he can sign, and I hope he chooses to. So, so it was a, a positive night for America because Harry Reid's been shielding President Obama from really having to do his job. There are 400 bills sitting in the United States Senate, including one of mine that I still hope to get done this year that passed the House, by the way, 395 to zero. It's a housing finance bill that the Senate hasn't taken up. And there wasn't one person in the House that was crazy enough to vote no on my bill. But Harry Reid just decided, well, I don't want to do anything with this bill. You know, it's been there for months and he hasn't done anything. And so now, hopefully, in the waning days of the session, we can actually get that bill passed and some of those other 400 bills. But in January, we're going to repass those bills and we're going to get them done. And we have other things that we're also going to do. So I want to talk about our agenda a minute, but I, before I do that, I want to quickly introduce a couple of my staff members that are here. Justin Barnes, stand up Justin. Justin does a lot of my <laughs> consumer finance issues. And we don't, in the legislature, we don't do, in the Congress, we don't do things by ourselves. It takes a lot of people, when you really get things done, to get them done. And I want to make sure I give my staff lots of credit. And uh, Courtney Whetstone, my chief of staff, is right behind him. Stand up, Courtney. So we all have a dedicated, hardworking staff behind us that work for peanuts in most cases and um, do a lot of great things. So I'm just proud to have the chance to work with those really smart, dedicated folks. So I want to talk about a few of the things we're going to do, and I feel like we will get done. The first is CFPB reform. Um, and thank you. As you know, the CFPB got created in the Dodd-Frank Act, one of the multiple things in that 2,200-page bill that, frankly, didn't need to happen, doesn't make sense, and doesn't, isn't working very well. Um, but we've got some great reform ideas that I think will help. Number one, today the CFPB has no financial accountability. They aren't, their, their budget does not go through the appropriations process like every other agency's does. And so they can take up to 10% of the Federal Reserve's money and just spend it with no accountability. It's worse than your college kids at college that send you a note that says, send money, because they don't say send money, they say, send this much money by next Thursday, and the Federal Reserve has to do it. It's, it is, there is no accountability. It is ridiculous, I just heard somebody say. It is ridiculous, and we have to fix that, and I feel like we are going to fix that. I think that's a really important thing to give them accountability. The second thing we, we're going to do on the CFPB, um, and that I think we're going to be able to get done, is create a board structure so that it's not one person. And I will tell you, of all the people that 
that President Obama could have chosen to run the CFPB. I, I'm from Ohio, but I actually think Rich Cordray might be the most reasonable person that President Obama could have picked to run the CFPB. But the difference is everybody around Rich Cordray is like an acolyte of Elizabeth Warren. They are, they are true believers, and so they call themselves behavioral economists. And behavioral economists is a new name, so I will describe what they are, and you'll figure out their new name. I might tell you by the end. So behavioral economists are people that think they know better than the consumer what's right for the consumer and what the consumer should choose. So they think they know better than the consumer what choices they should make. So what did we used to call those people? Does anybody remember? Communists. <laughs> so we did. We called, you know, they, they believe in central planning. And so it, it is, and that's not even a joke. It's true. So it's, uh, it's sad, but we, we need to bring some accountability to that agency, and a board structure, again, will help. I actually believe there are kind of two roadmaps for consumer protection. One is you educate people and entrust that they will make the right decisions for themselves. The other is you decide for people what they can do. One is an American model. That's educate people and let them choose the choices that work for them. The other is a Soviet model, and that is you decide for people. I prefer the American model. So I hope that we will work to transform that agency into much more of a financial literacy education um, institution. That's what it really should be. When you educate people and let people choose what works for them, there are certainly things that somebody could abuse, you know, that might work for one person and not for another, but who's better to choose that? The government taking away the option from everybody or empowering people, educating people, and letting people choose for themselves what's right for them? That is what America is all about, and that's the way we need to go with the bill or with the Consumer Financial Protection Agency. Marlon Stutzman does have a bill uh, that would nullify the 2013 rules the CFPB made and make sure that uh, anything that uh, was done was transparent on the desperate impact um, and make sure that uh, its impact on minority-owned, women-owned, and small businesses are considered before any rule would go into effect. Kind of you would think they would do that anyway, but apparently you have to tell them to do that, so I'm a co-sponsor of that bill, and I think we'll pass that bill, too, more specifically on the desperate impact, and I think that'll, that'll help fix things. I know there's a couple issues on tax reform I want to just briefly talk about, and you guys need to get engaged on those issues. Many of your small dealers still use the cash method of accounting, and for really small dealers, it's a great deal. They don't have to worry about, you know, when a bad debt expense, they don't have to worry about anything else. It's when you get cash, it's income, and when, and when you write something out, it's expenses. It's kind of the simple, you know, small business model that we've always had, and the tax reform model that Chairman Camp, who is retiring, put forward does away with the cash basis of accounting. I actually think the cash basis of accounting has some, um, it, it's important for small business, and I think we need to keep it. Uh, and I think, I think most of you that are small, or the folks that you represent that are small, also understand and believe that. So what I tell people on tax reform, and I'm going to tell you the same thing on LIFO, which, you know, last in, first out, has been a, an accounting method that a lot of people have used for a long time, including a lot of car dealers. And we should not change the rules in the middle of the road on people, because all it is is a government one-time cash grab. And even if that one-time cash grab is separated over 10 years, What's the benefit to the economy, to policy, to anything to do it other than grabbing more cash for the government? There's no benefit to it, having everybody on one basis of accounting. So uh, on those two issues, I would tell you be loud with your own representatives. Tell them how you feel. Make sure they know what's important to you. And then, you know, in our job, representative, we're supposed to represent you, so hopefully they will. But make the same noise with your senators. Tax reform is not going to happen before the end of this year, but it will happen uh, next year or the year after. It's going to happen, I think, in the next two years. So 
Uh, so please be loud about it, and, and the louder you are, the better it will be for you because, you know, that's kind of how the squeaky wheel does get the grease in politics. It's also the reason to get involved in your political action committee and support people that are supporting you because when you support people that are supporting you, then the people that you support will get elected and they'll be able to help you. It's kind of a no-brainer. So, and I'm not, you know, saying it for myself. I'm saying support Democrats that support you, support Republicans that support you. This is a public service announcement I'm giving you right here. So, <laughs> it's uh, self-serving at all. Um, but on tax reform, you know, be loud and make noise. And uh, I expect tax reform is going to be, um, it will happen. It will happen in the next two years, I believe, something will happen. And I think it will be a bipartisan tax reform. I don't think it'll be just one side pushing it. So work with Republicans, work with Democrats. Republicans are going to be in charge. Keep that in mind. So work with more Republicans. But, uh, but work with both and make sure everybody knows your point of view and what's important to you. Um, you know, we need to make the right choices for our country. That's why our voters sent us here. And um, I don't know about the president, but I heard the message of the voters that actually voted, not the ones that chose to stay home. And they sent a message. They want things to get done. They want, they want, I, I, the mess, other message I heard from voters as I went across my district is, they want us to work together. But they also want real solutions they're tired of the gamesmanship that Harry Reid was playing by just protecting the president from doing any work on legislation. They want us to get the problems facing this country solved. And even though the economy is starting to come back, and I've heard it from many of you when we were talking at the table, our recovery is still very tenuous. And the American consumer right now is holding on to cash. And they are paying off their credit cards, and they're being really responsible. They're doing the things that, you know, I want my kids to do. I have a five-year-old and a two-year-old. I want my kids to be responsible. The American people are being responsible right now, and I think that's a good thing. But we could, through regulations, really tighten things up to the point that they can't do the things they need to do. And when you don't have a car, you can't go to work. It's a problem. We can't do some of the things some of these guys want to do. And frankly, it will only affect a few people on the margins on not having a car. For most people, your car will just be more expensive because you're going to pay more interest. And, um, and that's, that's the kind of bad choices that I think we've got to stay away from. Things where, you know, it's a one-size-fits-all government rule that you guys see every day that actually, you know, are probably really well-intentioned but just hurt things moving forward. So um, the three things I want to leave you with today are be optimistic. I think there is a bright day coming really soon. Uh, number two, stay engaged and involved on things like tax reform because you have a lot at stake in tax reform. All Americans do, but all of you especially do because if we screw up tax reform, you guys are the ones that will pay the price before any of you throw us out of office. So please be engaged on those things and be loud about it um, and continue to be engaged even after we solve some of these problems, after we fix the CFPB, after we fix tax reform, because there are always things out there that are important. There are always policies that um, either need to be tweaked or changed. So the fact that you got engaged because things got kind of bad here and turned your pack back on and more people are coming to Washington and talking to your legislators, I just want to thank you for that because being engaged is what this republic is all about. If, if our constituents of our citizens aren't engaged, we'll never make the right choices. So God bless you for being engaged. That's the, the third thing I wanted to tell you. Um, and I think I told somebody at the table I'd talk a little bit about tax extenders too. So uh, we will pass a few of the tax extenders by the end of the year. Um, I believe we will pass the bonus depreciation one. Uh, I think we'll probably pass uh, the R&D tax credit, which is very popular, will probably pass the housing, low income housing tax credit. We'll probably pass about 20 of the 45 um, extenders, and that's just my one man's view of what I'm seeing going on, but we will get a bunch of them passed. But it's really unfair to all of you as business people to ask you to make permanent decisions on temporary tax policy. And the one thing I hope we'll do in the next Congress 
is make many of these permanent. And, and I think, frankly, I think we should pick the winners and losers and say, these we think are important enough to make permanent. These we don't quite think are important enough. We're going to let them expire. So be engaged as we do that if there, if there are those of the tax extenders that matter to you. I think bonus depreciation probably is one of them that matters to you. If there are others that matter, please make sure you're talking to your members and getting engaged because that is the other thing in the short term that will happen. Uh, and of course, I hope we keep the government open. The government shutdown was not exactly our finest hour in my time in Congress. Um, but uh, I think we will pass a uh, omnibus or continuing resolution that will keep the government open. And I think that's, you know, we need government. We just need effective government. It's really sad that we've had government that can't protect us from Ebola and can't protect or secure our border and that, you know, can't seem to get much right these days. Uh, what the American people want is an accountable government. They want an effective government. And I think they want a government that does what it needs to do but doesn't try to do everything. So that's why I ran for Congress, and that's what I'm working to bring to, um, to uh, America and to Ohio. Um, I'm lucky. One of the other things I've gotten to do, and I started to talk about it but didn't finish the three things I got engaged in, the third thing was I, I became a senior deputy whip. It's our job to actually help pass the Republican agenda. So there's, um, there's the whip. That's his job. And then he has five of us on a senior whip team, and then there are about 40 people on the big whip team that we use to talk to people to find out how people are going to vote. And that's how I know there are 20 guys that, and it's not always the same 20, there's the same 15 and five that rotate. But um, <laughs> there's, uh, there's about 20 people that have wanted to vote no on things that, and so it's going to be much easier for us now to pass our agenda because instead of twisting people's arms to do things they don't want to do, we're going to have the guys that don't want to vote no and we're going to be able to say to them, okay, do what you got to do, and then we'll have the people that, that can vote yes, and we'll be able to get things done. And I'm, I'm really excited about this real working majority we have in the House, and now the fact that there's a majority in the Senate. But keep in mind, the, uh, the filibuster rule and the cloture rule are still in effect in the Senate. So before you get excited about us being able to do everything we want to do, we need 60 votes in the Senate to uh, close down debate. So that is still going to be a hurdle. So we're going to need to work with Republicans and Democrats. If we have 54 Republicans, we'll need six Democrats on any given vote to close down debate. So again, we're going to have to have reasonable bipartisan bills. But I think America wants that. I'm not afraid of that. I think everybody wants that. So uh, that's kind of my view forward. I appreciate the chance to, to chat with you today. And Justin, I'm sorry, I just kind of was inspired by your speech as opposed to delivering it. But it was fabulously well written. I'm sorry I didn't deliver it as written. So thank you, everybody, for your time. God bless you.